Welcome to The Definitive Rap, where we report the truth about American exceptionalism. We love our flag, we love our country, and we believe in America. The Definitive Rap, where we respect people of faith, the men and women in blue, and our support for Israel. And now your hosts, Bela Sebro. She's the nice one. And Alan Skorsky. Uh, he's not so nice. But together they are the definitive rap. I'm Alan Skorsky with my co host, Bela Sebro, and welcome to the definitive rap, where we discuss the news items the mainstream media just won't touch. The definitive rap is proud to be the official podcast of vinnews.com. Most people can't remember what they did last week, let alone 45 years ago. So it was July 4th, 1976. While most Americans were celebrating Independence Day with fireworks and barbecues, the IDF was returning from Entebbe Airport with 102 rescued hostages. For a brief review, on June 27th, Palestinian terrorists hijacked a plane that had left Israel, bound for Paris with a stopover in Athens where the hijackers boarded. After refueling in Libya, the plane flew to Uganda in Africa. Soon after landing in Uganda, the hijackers released the non-Israeli passengers, but held the Israelis and Jewish passengers for ransom to release 53 Arab terrorists being held in Israel and European prisons. While Israel was considering its options, the terrorists extended their deadline to July 4th. This extra time allowed for the IDF to devise a rescue operation titled Operation Thunderbolt, later renamed Operation Yonatan after its leader, Yoni Netanyahu. The miracles included the release of the non-Israeli hostages, which allowed the Mossad to interview them to get a precise detail of the hostage shakers in the airport. The fact that an Israeli architect still had the Entebbe airport blueprints gave the IDF much needed information that the IDF had to fly 8,000 miles in specialized Hercules planes, one of which was 40,000 pounds overweight and almost couldn't take off due to extreme dry weather. These were just some of the miracles. Today's guest is former IDF General Matan Vilnai, whom Bela will introduce shortly, who was one of the heroes who led the IDF to Uganda to tell us about his role in the rescue and what it was like to participate in the greatest hostage rescue in history. Bela? Thank you, Alan. Although some of our younger audience may not have been born yet, I was a young child on June 27, 1976, when an Air France flight with 250 passengers from Tel Aviv to Paris was hijacked by a group of Arab and German terrorists in exchange for 53 terrorists. And the plane was diverted to Entebbe, Uganda, as more than 100 Israeli hostages were held captive. When a few days later, on July 4th, 1976, as the United States state celebrated its 200th birthday, the greatest hostage rescue operation ever in the world took place. I personally coined it Victory and Tebby. As young as I was at that particular time, uh, that rescue mission had a huge personal impact on me. My parents of blessed memory had friends who were on that hijacked flight that left Israel and who witnessed the hand of God through the IDF as miracles were being showered. It was at my parents' dining room table where these stories were being retold. And as I grew into adulthood, I always referred to that rescue mission as I did before, Victory and Tebby. Operation Thunderbolt or Operation Yonatan was always Victory and Tebby to me. And today I'm going to meet one of my childhood heroes and the hero of Operation Yonatan Thunderbolt or whatever they want to call it, but Victory and Tebby to me. Matan Vilnai, former general in the IDF. On the Entebbe rescue, he was the commander of the paratroopers brigade and led the first force that landed at the Entebbe airport and the second in command of the entire operation. General Vilnai also served as a member of the Labor Party as Minister of Science, Culture and Sports, Deputy Defense Minister and Minister of Defense of the Home Front. An ambassador, Currently, to, an ambassador to China. <laughs> Currently, he has become the president of the first China University in Israel for business and economics. General, oh my goodness, welcome 
to the definitive rap. Thank you. You had 48 hours to strategize and only 60 minutes to make this gripping tale of success without suffering major catastrophe on innocent hijacked victims. Please tell us now the secrets of that raid from start to finish, and especially the landing, which was the trickiest part. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my story. Okay. First of all, we were not heroes. This was our mission. And we served in the IDF in order to secure the state of Israel and our citizens all over the world, not only in Israel. And for us, it was obvious. You know, you won't believe it. I was then the commander of the best paratrooper brigade of the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, deployed in the Golan Heights, facing the Syrian army. You have to remember that it just three years after the Yom Kippur War, when they took us with full surprise in the Golan Heights. And I was there. And I heard in the radio that an high, they hijacked an, an airline, a French airliner, on his way from uh, Ben Gurion Airport to Paris. I went, we are talking 45 years ago. I took an atlas, I opened the atlas, there is no Google, there is nothing. Right. I opened the atlas and I looked, where is Antebbe? And I found it Antebbe on Lake Victoria, on the coast, on the northern coast of Lake Victoria, in the middle of nowhere, on the equator, thousands of miles from Israel. I called immediately, I called immediately my commander that was, that was in Tel Aviv, the chief paratrooper and infantry uh, general. Years after that, I took this position too. He is in charge of all the special operations of the Israeli Defense Forces. And he was a friend of mine. I called him and said, done. It was done Shabron. He was the, then the commander. I said, done. Let's go there and take them back home. What is the problem? We have to do it. I talked with no one. And he said to me, okay, we understand it. And that's it. It was, I believe, Monday night, maybe Tuesday morning. And he said to me, okay, with your own business. Thursday night, I visited one of my points along the border near Mount Hermon. He called me and said, come with 80 soldiers to this place near Tel Aviv. I didn't ask any question. I understood immediately what was going to be. I took my car. In two hours, I was there with 80, my best soldier, commanded by the battalion commander. And uh, I asked him, okay, what we're going to do? We had no intelligence. You have to understand that in order to have a, a, an operation like this, first of all, you need a very accurate uh, intelligence about everything. We had nothing, just nothing. We saw only a map that the pilot said there is a maps of all the airports in the world that you can find it whenever you want, you want. And we saw a sketch of the airport, only the runways. No terminals, nothing. And middle of the night, you won't believe it. He called me, he said, Dan said to me, okay, the Prime Minister would like to see the, the plan. I said, we have no plan. It was the night between Thursday to Friday morning. And uh, we came to Rabin. Rabin was the best Prime Minister I ever know. And I know some of them. I served as a minister and all this. He was very calm. He said to us, okay, what you can do? We show him nothing. And he said to us, I remember it at the end of my life. I know you red bird, part of us with red birds. You are sure that you can do everything. This operation, you can't do it. It was one o'clock in the morning. He sent it out of his office in Tel Aviv. And then looked at me, I looked at him, what we're going to do. And uh, we decided that we don't need any permission in order to go ahead. 
and we uh, gather our forces, our units, we gave an order, there is a military system how to launch an operation, you have to start with an order, and then to understand what is the planning of, of each unit, make it together, to coordinate it, and we did it. From uh, Friday morning, seven o'clock in the morning, till uh, Friday noon, and then he called us. He, it's Yitzhak Rabin, where are you? I said, we are ready. He said, okay, come again. He called Dan, I came with Dan, and we start all over again. He was absolutely right, okay, because our uh, plan of the operation was really nothing. We plan uh, to jump with hundreds of paratroopers of my unit to get to seize the whole area and then to take out the hostages. And the commander of the Air Force was a very smart general, Benny Pellet. He said to us, it's like robbing a bank. You don't conquer the bank. To the safe and out. You have to do this way, although he was not special op, but he was just a smart general and a smart person. And you know, all of them are not with us. All of them are not with us, 45 years ago. And uh, we uh, show, we, represent, we submit the program, we change it, we check it, and he said to us, okay, go ahead. It's not a permission, but you have to prepare yourself. We went back to uh, the unit that uh, we had all the rehearsal there. It's a uh, matkal, and uh, we have a plan. Friday night, it's the last, the first and last rehearsal. It was a catastrophe. But there is a long and old saying with the special operation that if the last rehearsal is catastrophe, it would be a very good operation. So uh, it was uh, again one o'clock in the morning. The chief of staff gathered the whole, the main commanders of the operation, I believe three or four of us, and he asked each one of us personally what he believed will be the success uh, of the operation. I am a very optimistic figure. And I said 50-50. My friends, my colleagues, they said less than 50-50. And he listened to us. He was not absolutely with us, but he was our commander. And uh, it was two or three o'clock in the morning. I decided to go home to take a sleep. I have to sleep. So I went to Jerusalem. It's less than an hour drive. I enter my uh, my house. My wife said to me, she awake and said to me, Matan, what we should do with the people in Uganda? I said, we can do nothing about it. Just nothing. And I took a sleep of two hours. And then I went back to the people that we can do nothing with them. I said nothing to her. And uh, Friday, uh, Saturday noon, last briefing, the chief of staff is in a cabinet meeting. So the deputy chief of staff, that he was absolutely with us. You have to understand, most of the generals were, they were not sure. But the deputy chief of staff, uh, you could tell Adam, he was killed in Lebanon in 82. And the uh, Air Force commander, Benny Pellet, they were under percent with us. And the main lesson of Antebe, and I said it now, it's that you don't need only the people high in the high levels. Antebe, it's a bottom up operation. It's not up down, it's bottom up operation. When I'm saying bottom, it's our level, it's colonel, it's not. Uh, it's not kids, but it's colonels, not the prime minister, not the minister of defense, not the, the, the chief of staff. They, of course, they approved it, but it was our feeling that we can do it. 
And it's very important, and when I'm talking about Antebbe to young officers, I tell them this is the most important lesson of Antebbe. Not a courageous operation, not far away, but the feeling in the rank and file down under that we can do it. It's very important. And there was the last uh, uh, briefing with the deputy chief, and one of the people asked him, and if uh, Dan Shabon, the commander, will be hit, he will take command, he looks, he said, Matan, this is your mission. I said to him, I know Dan, he will never get it. I uh, went with him, dozens of operations. He's a wonderful guy, and nothing will happen to him. And we flew. <laughs> When we took off from Sharm el Sheikh, four o'clock Saturday afternoon, there was no permission from the for the operation from the from the cabinet. They were still debating, and we took off. And there was some point above Ethiopia that we can refuel only Orient and Tebe or back home in Sinai in Israel. And we need to have a password to go ahead till this moment. And we got it. We got it. And uh, you, four heavy aircraft, the Hercules, the C-130, the best in the world, American made, of course. And uh, the, the <laughs> four aircraft approaching Antebbe, it's a military operation. So we sent three of them to circle 100 miles in the side, and we reach Antebbe with one aircraft, with the black Mercedes, with two jeeps, with the best unit of Sayyid Matkal, and my people that have the second, the second circle around them. And uh, in the first aircraft were all the commanders on the units to accomplish the mission. We reach Antebbe, and the control tower start to speak with broken English. Who are you? What are you doing? And the three, four of us stood in the cockpit, gave advices to the pilot. The pilot is a squadron commander, a Lieutenant Colonel, Siki Shane, a very uh, wonderful guy. He listened to no one. He just spoke with him with his uh, Palestinian English, his African English, and no one understand what is going on. And it was full light of the, of the uh, runway. And we just left without talking nothing. And then they took off the lights. We knew it before. And we had in my first, in the first plan, we had one of my units, eight paratroopers, commanded with now his very famous uh, General uh, Doron Almog, then he was a captain, a commander of my special unit. And uh, I uh, sent them, when the aircraft taxi on the runway, they jumped from both sides and they put lights next to the light, the Ugandan lights. And when they took off the lights, our lights on both sides were there. And the second uh, 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 transporter, the second pilot, he passed away a few months ago, a wonderful guy, Drew. He saw our lights and he landed accordingly. And then we drove to the old terminal. My unit took the uh, new terminal and the head and the uh, old area around. There was two circles, one circle of the old terminal, commanded by Sayed Matkal Bayon Netanyahu, a good friend of mine from Jerusalem. In a minute, I'll go back to it. And the second circle of all the units around under my command of paratroopers and everything. And uh, in 10 minutes, it was all over. They reached the old terminal. There was a two Ugandan soldiers. They start to shout to them. And Yoni pulled a pistol and shot them. He missed all the, the rounds. But it's open, it's open fire all around. 
and we lost the surprise element, and our soldiers stormed the old terminal, commanded by the second in command of Netanyahu, and Muki Betzer, one of he was my officer too. And in less than a minute, it was all over. Ten minutes since we landed, it was all over. And the hostages, they were shocked. They were really shocked. They won't believe it. And we killed one of the hostages because he jumped and he shouted in Hebrew, Jean-Jacques Maimoni, and he was killed on the spot. And we killed immediately the uh, terrorists around. They were German, two Germans and two Palestinians. And there were the other terrorists in another room and we killed them too. The Ugadin soldiers fled away and it was all over. And uh, <laughs> we had to refuse. I brought with one of the uh, transporters was a pump. Think what is a pump? It's some kind of a machine, it's a pump. In the middle of the night, I heard, I saw a train of uh, small uh, vehicles towed to each other, coming to my position, towed to a Peugeot 404, a small pickup. This is the pump. <laughs> we start to refuel, and then we got an order to stop it and to go to uh, Nairobi to refuel there. And we stopped the refueling, and there was a problem what to do with the pump, because the hostages, they took the place of the pump. So I had to take a decision. What to do, to leave the pump or to leave the Peugeot to the Ugandan? Because we can't take both of them. Of course, I took the pickup because it's of my, my brigade, the pickup is not mine, and I left the pump. <laughs> And we flew to Uganda, and uh, there I realized that Yoni is dead, because before we were sure he is something that is injured, something like this. We I saw his body and I understood that he, uh, that it, he was dead. We grew up in the same neighborhood in Jerusalem. His father was a professor. My father was a professor. And there was a rumor in Jerusalem that the Israeli commando raided Antebbe and one high officer from the paratrooper from Jerusalem, his father, a professor, was killed. It could be or me or young. And think about my wife back in Jerusalem when we heard that we can do nothing about the, the hostages and what happened there. And we flew back home. We were on the ground, I believe, 50 minutes, something like this. The most important thing was, first of all, to take them by surprise, and we did it. And then, you won't believe it, to count the hostages. You have to know that the moment, and you mentioned it before, that they decided to send all the people back to Paris and to only the Israelis and the Jewish people will remain. For us, it was obvious that we have to do it. Till then, they were talking about, it's not our problem, it's a French problem, it's a French airliner, it's nothing. The main lesson is that we can do it only by ourselves. There is no other way. And it's not heroic. It's our mission. It's obvious. And in the future, if we we'll have to do it again, we can do it again. And as I said before, it's bottom up. It's not that the prime minister and the cabinet decided. Right. You know, the commander of the intelligence officer, the commander of the intelligence, the military intelligence, Shlomo Gazit, he passed away a year ago. He told me that he was in the, in the cabinet and Rabin said to the ministers, we have no other option only to send our people there. 
to bring them back home. Because before they were talking about uh, dealing with the, uh, with the terrorists and giving them whatever they want. You have to remember that in 1970, 1968, one year after the, the Six Day War, they took our El Al plan from Rome to Algeria yes. and we gave whatever they asked us in order to bring our people back home. It was 10 years before. It was in eight years before, eight years before. And in Antebbe, our feeling was that we can do it. When I'm saying we, at the level of the brigade commanders, of the special unit commanders, and we show confidence to the high command that we can do it. In the military, the most important figure is the chief of staff. He is not the commander of the army, but he is the main military figure. The commander is the Israeli cabinet, the Israeli government. And he was not with us. He was not sure that we can do it. And for us as soldiers, it's very easy. The chief of staff don't believe in it, so we won't do it. But we decided that we can do it. It's the most important lesson from Antebbe is the responsibility of the low level. It's not only the high level as we use to see them on the TV in peacetime that we, they talk all the time and we are in the field. The main lesson is that we are the most important figure. I used to say the people in the bloodline, which means in the front, are the most important people. Right. We need the headquarters, we need the generals. I was a general, I know it. And it's very important to, to have the whole strategy. But in order to accomplish a mission, it's our problem. And Antebbe, it's a wonderful example that we can do it, and it's our responsibility. We feel it, we understand it, and we push up, we can do it. This is our show Antebbe. Okay. And I'll tell you just a small story. You know about, about the Black Mercedes. Where is my Black Mercedes? Okay. I have a picture of the Black Mercedes. In a minute, I'll bring it. Yeah. In a minute. Wait a minute, I'll bring the picture. Okay. Can you see it? Wow, yes. I remember that this picture. The Black Mercedes. Oh, and wow. Today, on the side, this young officer. It's me. It's when we uh, landed back in uh, Ben Gurion Airport, and this is the Black Mercedes. And uh, the soldier next to me was after that the CEO of the Ministry of Defense. Many years, when I was a deputy, he was the CEO of the Ministry of Defense. And this is the Black Mercedes. And yes. the of the Black Mercedes. It's very simple. We saw in one of the film about Antebbe Airport that the high uh, officials of uh, Uganda are coming to the airport with a black Mercedes and two jeeps. Okay. And we said, okay, we have to bring this black Mercedes and two jeeps. And fine a black Mercedes in Israel of 76, Thursday's night, you need it immediately, on the spot. It's not, now I believe it's very easy. Yeah. After that, I was the uh, ambassador to China, to Beijing, and one of the diplomats, the Israeli diplomat said to me, ambassador, the black Mercedes is mine. Said to him, I know it, everyone is saying that it is and he showed me a letter from the Minister of Defense. They, they took the, the Mercedes, it was not black. They took the Mercedes and uh, they needed in a short time and that's it. And Yoni gave an order to his people to find uh, Saturday morning. You know what is meaning of Saturday morning in Israel. Yeah. To find a uh, paint and to paint the Mercedes in black. He sent people and they entered a store in Petrotigva. They took it 
The store owner was, of course, in synagogue. They took him from synagogue. He opened the store. They took it and they painted it on the, on, the, on the last moment. And the black Mercedes is very important in order to take them with full supply. This is the story of Antabe. It's now, after 45 years, it seemed to be something fantastic. Yeah. But for us then, it was obvious that we are going to do it, and we are the only ones, and we can do it. And this is the story of Antabe. Yeah. So, General, I was 13 during the hijacking, and I was in London, and I flew to Israel the day after the rescue from my brother's bar mitzvah. And every time I watch the videos on YouTube, I promise you, I'm a tough guy. I cry every time. I think about you and your colleagues. And, and I, I watched the interviews. There was, uh, you mentioned Shiki Shani and, uh, and Muki Betzer and, and, and Amnon Biran, all of them. I think you were in your 20s and you're in your, you were your 30s. You're kids. You're not today wise people. And you're flying to Uganda. And I think in the video it said that, they gave you, the Knesset gave you the green light an hour before your landing. And again, we have about three minutes left. Can you tell us what goes through the mind of a 30-year-old? Because even though you said, you know, you said you're not a hero, you're a hero, but you want to be modest, that's fine. What goes through the mind of a 30-year-old one hour before you're about to touch down in Uganda? This wasn't Sabina. This wasn't at, in, in Lord Airport. This is in Uganda. What goes through the mind? We've about two and a half minutes left. What goes through your mind? It's a wonderful question. A really wonderful question. And I must tell you, we're over the jungle. You won't believe, I was saying to myself, we are on the, on the own direction. Home is there. Why you are you flying there? It's all the time it's running on your mind. But at the end, you understand that you must do it. And there is no other way. I was then uh, 76, I was then 32 years old. I was a very old uh, full colonel of 30, uh, two, uh, 32 years old. And in some point, this is the mission of a life. Although I uh, participate in dozens of missions all over the Middle East. And uh, as a young mayor, as a, as a young captain, I launched an operation in Upper Egypt and a lot of stories. But for me, as I said before, it was, we must do it. And you have to know that we had an operation two years before in my lot and we failed. And 20 kids have been murdered there by the terrorists yeah. and there was a very famous picture all over the media of those days of a young soldier with a girl on his hand wounded girl this wounded girl is now a mother of two paratroopers so what is the question right uh general uh we have just a few seconds left. This was the most daring mission of my generation. How did this mission shape Israel? What effect did it have on the country and the morale of its citizens? I could tell you what it did for me personally, but I want to hear from you the effect it had on Israeli citizens. I can tell you that they sent me to the U.S. first time in my life to speak to submit, to present the operation to the Jewish community all over the state. And there was a cartoon in California. You won't believe it. I, I, had, to, I, I had to keep it. The cartoon was saying, the United States of America, don't be afraid, Israel behind you. That's it. Okay. This is <laughs> General, thank you for joining us today on the Definitive Wrap. Thank you to our audience for tuning in and to vinews.com for our show being their official podcast. Shalom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to The Definitive Wrap with your hosts, Bela Sebro and Alan Skorsky. 
Be sure to tell your family and friends they also can listen to The Definitive Rap on Apple Music, Spotify, Google Play, and your favorite streaming service. See you next time on The Definitive Rap. Thank <laughs> you.